Hello, we are excited that you have chosen to join us today as we have come together to, to worship God. Our desire is that you would be encouraged in this time, that you would be uh, desiring to do things that are pleasing to him. Something that we want to continue to, to stress as a church during this season of life is the importance of prayer. That you would take time to consider, that you take time to be still and reflect on the many gifts that God has given us. To just go before him and, and thank him and, and, and praise him for those things. But at the same time, if you are, are struggling and there's things in your life that you find are overwhelming, that you would give them over to him because he is more than capable of, of helping you through those times. If there's any way that we as a staff or a church can be in prayer for you, we, we would encourage you to, to call the church or to email the church to let us know. We would love to come alongside of you and to uphold you in prayer uh, and to support you in, in that way. Something that we're really excited about right now is the upcoming Christmas Eve service. It's something that we've been planning, putting together, and, and thinking about for this year. It's going to be a great opportunity to reflect on, to remember, to celebrate the coming of Jesus. And even though this year is going to be different than, than many uh, that we've remembered and celebrated in the past, one thing that we know for sure is the one that we celebrate has not changed. The reason that we celebrate has not changed. Jesus has come to the earth. God, Emmanuel, with us. Uh, this service will be released on December the 24th, and we want to encourage you to take some time to, to, to be involved, to watch with those in your house, and to remember and reflect on Jesus and his coming. This morning, we're going to spend some time together worshiping um, in song. Uh, we're going to be lighting the Advent candle, and we're going to be looking into God's word as an encouragement for this week. Before we do that, I want to read some verses from Psalm 96, verses 1, 1 to 9. Psalm 96 and verses 1 to 9. And this is what these verses say as a call to worship for us today. Oh, sing to the Lord. Sing a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of all the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord, he made the heavens and the earth. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his presence. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Let's pray together. Father God, we come before you today. We, we thank you for the invitation from your word to come and, and to worship. And, and God, we do pray that as we worship you this morning in song, as we reflect on the Advent, as we, we come into your word, God, that, that, that your view and who you are would be magnified. That we would see you for who you are. That as we celebrate this time of year, God, that we would remember that, that, that your son, Jesus, came as God, Emmanuel, with us. And so God, as we come, as we sing, and as we, we do these things that we do as we meet together, may you be glorified. May our hearts be encouraged. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.
Where rocks and earth 
The scripture reading for today is John 3:16 to verse 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God.
Merry Christmas. Found myself a cute little cabin here. I've come up from the Comox Lake Dam up towards the Forbidden Plateau Hill Ski Hill. And uh, fun, fun little place. I love these little finds that you come out into the forest and just enjoy a cute little cabin. We're beginning a Christmas series, putting Romans 8 on hold for a few weeks. And we're talking about this is Christmas. What is Christmas? The peace, the joy, the glory to God, the baby that was born. It's all about that baby that was born. Today we're going to focus in on when the angels were singing, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth. I remember as a child one of my first Christmas memories. Sitting under the Christmas tree, get up and you look out the window, big snowflakes falling down, the heat registers are blowing air. We'd get our blankets and we'd sit, put them over top of the heat registers as a little fort, have our stuffies all around us. And then we'd lay there and we'd just look up at the lights of the Christmas tree. With those bubble lights, when they heat up, bubbles start going up, the little liquid spout up top, and we'd just be mesmerized. We'd watch for hours. And to me, there was nothing wrong in the world at all. There was most definitely peace on earth. But of course, as you grow up, you experience life a little bit, you watch the news, you start to wonder, wait a minute, where is this peace on earth that the angels talked about? Silent night we sing. But was it a silent night? Look at the first Christmas story that ever happened when Jesus was born. The Romans were occupying Israel. Caesar goes and he issues this decree. And he enforces, he puts this public order on all of the people. You must travel from your place to the place of your birth. Major cost, major inconvenience, and huge suspicion amongst the people. Why does he want this census? Why does he need my name? Isn't that my private information? How come he's going against all of my rights here? And yet, he was Caesar. The people had to travel. And so Mary and Joseph, they're on the back of that little donkey, and they come into that old little town of Bethlehem. How still we see thee lie. Except it wasn't very still at all. It was bustling. They get to the first hotel. Mary says, you make reservations here. Joseph says, oh, Cell phone batteries died. I didn't get a chance. Well, let's try it out. No room. The next place, no room. We should have made reservations. I know we should have made reservations. We should have driven faster. I know, but this donkey just wouldn't speed up. And Mary was in labor, right? Don't know what it's like in labor, but there's Mary bouncing along on the back of the donkey. When you're driving to the hospital and in labor, any little crack on the road, you feel like a major speed bump. And there's Mary toughing it out. Joseph saying, we need to hurry up, find a place in the inn. There was no place in the inn. Finally, they get a little place out back, small little stable with the animals. And there, Jesus is born. Amongst all the political tension, the hustle and bustle of the census, everything else, that's the Christmas story. But that first Christmas, there wasn't peace on earth. As rumors spread, a new king has been born and Herod got wind of this. He flew into a fit of rage. Mary and Joseph had to pack up baby Jesus, travel, flee to Egypt. Refugees. Peace on earth. Here they are, refugees. And for all those babies that didn't flee, got caught up in the rage of Herod, and his murderous, murderous rage, no peace on earth for them. Sometimes I wonder, did the angels get it wrong? Like, why didn't God just do his thing, right? Just do something special, make an arrangement, so at least there could be peace on earth that one night. And we love to have Christmas as this serene, peaceful, nostalgic time that's just full of holiday cheer. Over the years, talking to people, they say Christmas, family reunion, old rivalries, new arguments, somebody always ends up going home early. This Christmas, people don't even get to spend time with their extended families 
and everywhere else. And that's the story. And we read, glory to God, peace on earth. And I don't want to be skeptical. I don't want to be a downer. And I, I hope this isn't depressing you. But you know what? As I read those words of the angels, I'm convinced that it's truth. That this baby coming into the world, something happened that night where peace was going to begin to reign. And I don't think we can avoid the question of reality around us. The band U2, they have a song and it goes like this. Jesus, in the song you wrote, the words are sticking in my throat. Peace on earth, hear it every Christmas time. But hope and history won't rhyme. So what's it's worth, this peace on earth? Hope and history won't rhyme. The angels announce good news of great joy for all people. Hope. We look at history, we begin to wonder. And yet we continue to celebrate Christmas 2,000 years later. We continue to proclaim joy and peace, glory to God. And if there wasn't something about that baby being born, we would have been disillusioned long ago and stopped celebrating. But there is hope. Jesus coming to this world brings us hope and it keeps us singing. So let's investigate for a moment where a lack of peace comes from. Imagine two boys, they're playing, they've got their game, they're best friends, they're always spending time together. A bit of a rivalry starting to form. The game, the tension's rising high. Pretty soon a few words are exchanged. You cheated. No, I didn't. Next thing you know, the erupt and the table goes flying and the peace is everywhere. More words are exchanged. Pushes and shoves. More words storming out. And what was once a good friendship is now a rivalry. What's the root of that? Did they just need better supervision? Clearer rules to follow in the game? More regulated behavior? When you dig down deep into the arguments and the, the, the rivalries that begin, it doesn't always lead to a selfishness, a pride, some sort of sin that grips our hearts, that won't let go, will hold grudges, won't forgive. And it's all about me, my way, my rights, I'm right. Think about marriages. How many times do marriages go sour and what's the root of it? James says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Is it not the evil desires within you? I have to be right. If they only knew what they did to me. They'll never change. I want things my way. They aren't making me happy. Maybe there's somebody better out there. I deserve more. What causes a lack of peace? It'll always dig down to a root in our heart that comes from sin. Sin is the problem. It robs our peace. And I know our problems are complex. We can't just boil it down to a simple answer. But if we investigate, I can guarantee that sin will be at the root of all of the problems. Think of political peace in this world around us. So many countries in turmoil. And I don't even begin to understand the complexities of all of those situations. And yet isn't there a pride, a selfishness, a sin? And the Bible story clearly shows that the pain and death and lack of peace that's in this world is because of sin. And so when the angels announce glory to God, peace on earth, when we look for peace, if we're to have peace, it has to deal with the problem of sin. We diagnose the problem, we see that sin is at the root. So what's the cure? It must deal with the problem. That's where the angels didn't just stop there and announce glory to God, peace on earth, but they said, there's this baby who's born in the town of Bethlehem, a Savior who is Christ, the Lord. Christ, the Savior. What's he going to save us from? The real problem. He's not just going to put nice measures in place to push, sin, to push lack of peace aside, 
just to make it a silent night just for a few moments and just give us a little bit of reprieve, sweep everything under the rug. No, he's going to deal with the real problem. And of course, there's lots of temporary fixes that can be done. We can arrange circumstances and make policies and have public health orders. There'll always be another problem. But the Savior, who is Christ the Lord, will come and lead and rule in such a way that will bring peace, a true, deep, lasting peace. And that's why the first Christmas wasn't silent. Jesus came and he took on flesh. Jesus was God and he put human skin on. Emmanuel, God with us. When Jesus came into this world, he didn't make himself immune from pain and suffering. He didn't isolate himself from troubles. He wasn't this baby with a permagrin on, laying in his manger in a little halo, just floating above the ground. No, Jesus took on flesh. He entered our pain, the discord and turmoil of this world. And when Jesus grew up, he didn't hide from troubles. He didn't sit around cross-legged, humming, all oh, just with a serenity and peace. But rather, he walked with sinners. He ate with people who were isolated. He himself faced many difficulties. Jesus didn't just push aside the troubles of this world and say, here I am, I'm going to clean everything up. Rather, he entered in to sin, this world that's full of sin with all its effects. And then he was going to take that upon himself. That's why it wasn't a silent night. If it was, he would have just swept everything aside. But instead, he entered into the bustle, the turmoil, the noise and the trials. And Jesus lived a sinless life, always bringing glory to God. He faced hardships. Friends betrayed him. People plotted against him. Others falsely accused him. They beat him, spat on him, mocked him, whipped him. And utterly exhausted, they brutally killed him. Jesus didn't make himself immune to the lack of peace on earth. Instead, as Isaiah says, he took up our affirmities, carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. The punishment that brought us peace was put on Jesus. And that was written hundreds of years before the angels came and announced, glory to God, peace on earth. Jesus didn't stay away from troubles, but rather he took them upon himself. As some had said, the answer, God's answer to the problem of suffering is that he came right down into it. And in dealing with sin, Jesus opened up the way for there to be peace on earth. The answer to suffering isn't an answer, it's the answer, Jesus himself. It's not an argument, but a person. It's not an abstract issue, it's a personal issue. It requires a personal response. And Jesus came to bring peace, and he did that, born as a baby to be the savior. Did it work? We see the resurrection. He didn't stay dead. He conquered our sin. He rose from the grave so that he could reign forever. I think seeing Jesus and what he did, dealing with the problem of sin, can help us understand the dilemma that you two faced in their song, saying hope and history don't rhyme. The lack of peace in this world, yep, it's evident. But that doesn't mean that when Jesus came, he was ineffective. Yes, we read the news, we see the turmoil, we see troubles. But it all comes through Jesus being Christ, the Lord. Do you allow Jesus to reign in your heart? That's the question that we're getting to. Because peace on earth, peace comes as Jesus reigns. The angels connected the glory of God to the peace that's coming. If God isn't glorified in your life, there can be no peace. Now, God is glorious. We see that. We see his beauty, his power, his wisdom, his might. 
God is worth more than anything. But too often, don't we give glory to other things above God? Usually it's ourself, isn't it? We value our own worth above anything else. Isn't that where sin starts? When we replace God's worth with ourselves of being a higher worth, then pride and selfishness and other sins really start to grow, manifest themselves, and rob us of that peace. God gets glory as we turn aside from sin. Ruling our own lives? Nope. We want to recognize that God is the highest worth. And as we glorify God in our lives, His peace begins to rule because sin is pushed aside. And as the peace of God rules in our lives, God then receives more glory. He's proved the gloriousness that He is. That's why I love the Christmas message. Glory to God. Peace on earth. God gets glory. We get peace. And that comes because Jesus entered into this world, not in a silent night, but in a night of turmoil, so that he could bring that silence, that rest, that peace into our lives. If you want the peace of God to rule in your life, God must rule in your life. God's purpose isn't to give you peace separate from himself. His purpose is to give you peace by being the most glorious in your life, And that's why the angels connect glory to God in the highest, peace on earth. Because Jesus came to take away our sin. And as we stop, or as we turn to Jesus and stop making much of ourselves, we glorify God. And as that happens, his peace begins to rule. As we talk about peace on earth, peace is multifaceted. It comes in a few ways. First, there's a peace within a heart at rest. There might be turmoil and trouble and trial all around us, but inside, there's a peace. There's also peace with others. Yes, there's ongoing tensions, but God works in such a way to bring about reconciliation. There's ultimately peace with God, and that's the foundation and the base of everything. And there's an ultimate peace. A day is coming. When Jesus returns, no more wars, no more pain, no more suffering, just peace. So let's briefly look at these areas. First of all, the peace within. And for the peace of God to rule in your life, as we've said, God must rule in your life. Now, if sin is the operating system of your heart, there is no peace. There's an ongoing battle that's present within our lives of who's going to be a ruler. Will it be God as our king and authority? Will it be me? And as we allow God to rule, through what Jesus has done, it changes our heart. The the rest, the, 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 the solitude, the serenity of our lives. Now we need to know that Jesus came to took the peace upon himself. Have you confessed your sin, repented, called Jesus your Lord? That's what the angel said. Jesus will be the king. He'll be the Lord. And for peace to come, you must come to a place in your life where you give control over to Jesus. Where you you allow him to forgive your sin and, and to lead in your life. Now peace... Sin always wants to rob us of peace. But it's as our sin is dealt with and forgiven that peace is actualized. Philippians 4.13, famous verse, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And then what does it say? The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. As we give control and leadership over to God, we give Him thanks for who He is even in our trials and turmoil. It's His peace comes. Peace is possible in your life. It won't do away all the clutter, all the turmoil, all the hardships. It won't just be a silent night, but there still can be peace. So that you can lay there 
And in all of your thoughts and struggles and your groanings, there can be a peace. It is possible. Think of Jesus when he was sleeping in the boat. A storm comes up. All his disciples, they're freaking out. They're in a panic. There's the, the water's boiling all around them, coming into the ship. Jesus is asleep. They wake up Jesus, and he says, don't fear. He asks them, why are you afraid? He's like, well, there's a storm. Look at all of the troubles. Then Jesus calms the storm. If they only recognized who was in the boat with them, the power of Jesus, wake them up and say, Jesus, we're in trouble here. In your storms, you can know that Jesus is with you. He's already entered into humanity. He took on flesh. He took sin upon himself. He conquered the grave. He's with his Father, but he hasn't left you alone. In all of your storms, you can have peace. You can be still and trust. Because peace is directly related to trust. As we glorify God by trusting Him, He gives a peace that doesn't even make sense in a storm. And then God gets more glory, because that's how it works. God works and we see His wonders and then we glorify Him and give Him that praise. And then this peace within our hearts starts to come, just like the angels announced. Even in a world of turmoil, an unstoppable, invisible peace is there. We could have a whole series on this peace and actualizing it and trusting in God and seeing what does it mean because it's complex. It's not just a simple answer. But for now, we'll leave it at that. Trust in Jesus and allow His peace to flow in your life. Another area to have peace is peace with others. Again, a huge topic. But Romans 12 says that we can live at peace with others as far as it depends on you. Relationships are complicated. Reconciliation, goes, it takes two directions, right? You can extend yourself. You can offer forgiveness even if they don't respond. But to have peace in relationships, to have that reconciliation, it goes two ways. But when it tells us as far as it depends on you, strive for that. This Christmas season, are there people in your life that you don't have peace with? Those are the discord, grudges, hardships. What can you do to bring about a little bit more peace on earth? To extend something, to humble yourself. And they're probably all wrong and you're probably all right. But still, wouldn't you rather be wrong, humble yourself? To fix that relationship. Jesus came to bring peace on earth. And as God is glorified, as we forgive, as we extend ourselves to say, hey, I want to mend things and make things right. You can't control the outcome, but you can take a first step. Isn't that what God did for us? In Romans 5, it says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't wait for us to come to him and say, okay, you're right, and I've cleaned up my whole life. No, in the midst of our sin, in our worst moments, when we were down and turned our backs on God, God says, I'm still sending my son. I'm still seeking to save that what is lost. And if that's what God has done for us, surely we can do that for others. Peace is possible because God started it. He sent this baby that we celebrate so that there can be peace. Peace in your own life. Peace with others around you. And there's an ultimately a peace that comes. One day Jesus will return. There'll be no more wars or trouble. It's written, He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. One day Jesus will return. And he will reign and ultimately reign. We look forward to that day. In anticipation, we live today glorifying God and living amongst his peace. But we have this hope that peace will come. Because right now, hope and history don't rhyme. It doesn't match up. We see troubles all around us. 
But that day hasn't come yet. Because just as we see in the news and we experience in our lives, there's a lot of lack of peace out there. But God's getting the glory as he roots out the sin and forgives it and makes things right. Peace is coming. So in conclusion, the angels announced glory to God, peace on earth. How'd that happen? God became man. He took on flesh. He dwelt among us in the turmoil, in the hardships. He bore our iniquities. He took the punishment so that we could have the peace. So can we sing the song Silent Night with integrity? You bet we can. Because although the world was bustling, although there was political tension and unrest, God was doing something. This baby came, glorifying God, bringing peace. And so silent, yes, serene, still, calm. That's the effects of Jesus entering in to the turmoil of this world. So as I lay under the Christmas tree this year, looking up at the lights, I know there can be peace on earth, a real deep peace that starts because of what Jesus has done in my own heart, extends to the people around me, and this hope of looking forward to the future, of that day when there'll be no more wars or pain or trials. So let's pray. Let's offer our hearts to God so that we can experience His peace. Father God, thank you for the Christmas story. And this is Christmas, celebrating glory to you, peace for us. So we give our lives to you. We thank you for your forgiveness. We cling to Jesus as our Savior and as our Lord, and we anticipate the peace within. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in
We want to thank you again for joining us today. As you go through this week, continue to reflect on the many gifts that God has given. In 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 15, it says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And so as you go into this week, reflect on the grace of God shown to you, shown to us in Jesus Christ, his son. Have a great week. God bless.